Wow. So for those of you uh, like me who have spent a few years here at Purdue, man, that brings back some memories. It's a, a timeline, really a chronicle of a lot of our Purdue experiences. Um, my name is Brad Kreitz, and uh, I am honored to welcome you on behalf of Mortar Board, Purdue Student Government, and the Purdue Graduate Student Government to uh, what we're calling Dr. Cordova's last lecture. Um, I, we appreciate your attendance, and, and we hope that you are excited to hear from her as she is excited to share. Um, before I begin, um, I want to make sure to uh, take the opportunity to uh, not only introduce our, our guest of honor, but introduce her guest of honor. Uh, first gentleman, Chris Foster, is with us this evening. as are many other students, staff, faculty, administrators around Purdue. Um, you know, as, I'm watched, as I watch that video, I'm reminded of just how much Purdue has changed over the past five years during Dr. Cordova's tenure. Uh, we've expanded our facilities. We're continuing to lead cutting edge research across many different disciplines. And student success metrics, uh, almost no matter how you slice them, are at an all time high. Dr. Cordova's legacy and her impact at Purdue are easily visible no matter who you are or what your Purdue experience has been. You know, people often refer to Dr. Cordova as a student-focused president. And it's one thing to be called a student-focused president, it's another to live as one. And every interaction that I've had with Dr. Cordova over the last four years, whether it be her including launching tomorrow's leaders as one of the main pillars of the New Synergy strategic plan or supporting students through the $100 million renovation of the Recreational Sports Center or through supporting students through the development of the Center for Student Excellence and Leadership. The list goes on and on. And time and time again, I, I've been in meetings with Dr. Cordova where the first question on her mind is always, well, wh what do the students think? And it's not a question, it's not a rubber stamp, it's really how she's operated during her last five years here. And I've been honored to have my time at Purdue overlap with hers. But tonight, tonight's not necessarily a celebration of all of her accomplishments, which are, are varied and well-deserved. Um, tonight's a, an opportunity to celebrate Dr. Cordova as a person, um, to, to celebrate her life and her learnings during uh, her time at Purdue. Um, I was given, I, I guess in order to frame tonight um, for us, I, I was given the opportunity about a year and a half ago, and, and I would call it the undeserved opportunity, of sharing dinner with Dr. Cordova, Neil Armstrong, and Captain Solly Sollenberger, the pilot who landed the plane on the Hudson River. And, and I remember sitting at dinner, <laughs> quiet as a 20-year-old should be in the presence of those three, and, and I remember watching Dr. Cordova interact with Neil Armstrong, who um, I, I know is one of her role models and idols and, and one of the reasons that um, she pursued a career in astrophysics and, and possibly even NASA. And, and I remember seeing an awestruck look in her eyes and I, I remember seeing her almost visibly trembling. And then I remember thinking to myself, that's the exact same way that I've felt every single time I've seen her over the last four years. And so in those moments at dinner, getting to see the person behind the president was amazing to me. And so I know that many of us in the room have had that opportunity to, to see her as, a, a, as the person. And, I, and it's been while she was setting world records, spitting crickets, or eating with students in the dining courts, or hosting them at Westwood, or dancing in the end zone to shout. Um, she, we've had those glimpses, and so tonight I hope that, that we have another glimpse and, and that we get to see um, uh, indeed the person behind the president. So without further ado, um, I, it's my honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. France Cordova. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Brad. That was just a, a great introduction. You know, seeing the photo of that fountain there reminds me that I ran through that fountain with all my clothes on <laughs> once upon a time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs>
that's how the Grand Prix race started off last Saturday, and that's how every race starts off. There's a lot of noise, there's clouds of exhaust, and then everyone settles into her or his pace. The laps click by. There are some slides and some bumping and flags. Yellow ones, meaning caution. Green ones, all clear. There's some lapses in attention and some focused moments when things get tense. A few times when you're on a stretch by yourself and a time or two when you get pushed off the road. You get back on. You run out of gas. Pit stop. You refuel. You squint because the sun is in your eyes. Darn it, forgot my sunscreen. This is my last lap as president of Purdue. I've been asked to talk to you about my life lessons. Tyler Takel, who serves on the executive committee for Mortarboard, asked me to take off my president's cap and speak to students person to person. He said he wants students to see, quote, what has shaped my life, my core values, my drive, my successes, my challenges, my knowledge. First, I'd like to thank Mortarboard and the Purdue student government and the graduate student government, not only for this invitation, but for everything you do to improve student life at Purdue. Congratulations on your many achievements this year and in past years. You've built on a great legacy of the students who've gone before you, and you've left a remarkable foundation for future generations of students. Hail Purdue. I'll start with the summary of my early laps leading up to Purdue, BP or before Purdue. And then I'll talk about my Purdue era at Purdue, and I'll summarize with lessons learned, LL, lessons that I can offer you. I started in grade school thinking I would write deeply, like Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk. Discovered what mattered, like Albert Einstein, the physicist. And investigate clues, like fictional detective Nancy Drew. I was the oldest of 12 children, so I was busy. You can see me there in the middle, just above my mother. The expectations of my parents were high, and that was a defining influence. I had a hard-working, driven dad. Bill Marriott reminded me of my dad when he spoke last week at the dedication of Purdue's new Marriott Hall of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Mr. Marriott told us that he would rather inspect a hotel kitchen on a Saturday morning than play golf. And that's why, at the age of 80, he doesn't know how to play golf. And my father had that attitude. He loved his work as a contractor and an importer, and he didn't tolerate A minuses. I grew up with the responsibilities and expectations of an oldest child. In high school, I was on the debate team, performed in plays, and was a cheerleader. That's a picture of me with the cheerleaders at Purdue. I was West Covina's teenage miss, the girl state representative for my high school, see if you can find me in the picture on the top, and named one of California's 10 outstanding youths by the Chamber of Commerce. In high school, we girls were discouraged from an interest in science. We had no role models visiting the campus, and no teacher ever talked about women as scientists or engineers. 
It was all we could do to get an A minus in a chemistry class. And physics, that was a B plus. That was our glass ceiling. I was the first girl from my high school to be accepted to Stanford University. And as my male debate partner was also accepted, off we went. At Stanford, I majored in English because there were no women majoring in physics. I also had wanderlust in me, a desire to experience new things, a yearning to see the world firsthand. So I chose student abroad experiences in Florence, Italy, where I wrote poetry and attended a Grand Prix race at La Manza. And Oaxaca, Mexico, where I studied the Zapotec language and wrote a story about the Zapotec women of the Pueblo. That story got me selected as a guest editor for Mademoiselle magazine, then headquartered in New York City. I'd always fancied winning that college competition because Sylvia Plath and Joyce Carol Oates, a couple of famous women writers who I admired, had won that competition years before. But before that summer in New York, I had a few months on my own because I graduated early from Stanford in 3.3 years. I decided that I'd see a little bit of the U.S. on the way to New York. And so, where's a girl going to go with time on her hands? I went to Vail, Colorado to ski and had to get a job. So I got a job as a cocktail waitress at the No Name Cafe. And then when the snow melted, I was off for New Orleans, where I got a job. Now I'd had some experience, again as a cocktail waitress, on Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. And with no Purdue hospitality and tourism management degree. It was still about that wanderlust. I wanted to see firsthand the places that I had read about that seemed iconic to me. I finally arrived in June in New York to work for Mademoiselle, only to find that the magazine was taking its guest editors to Israel to write about the country for the August issue of the magazine. It was my first time climbing up to the fortress called Masada and swimming in the Dead Sea. We visited Bethlehem and danced on the Golan Heights. It was an adventure. I wrote the travel feature for the magazine shown here, Shalom, We Echo, Shalom. By a complicated path, I ended up at Caltech studying astrophysics, and that part of my story is too long for tonight. I was inspired by Neil Armstrong's moonwalk and by a public television special about newly discovered accreting neutron stars an illustration of one is also shown on this image. I wanted to be part of that action. I was finally at the point, having graduated, where, when I felt in control of my future. I realized that I could be whatever I wanted to be. And I set my goal to do so by the time I was 30. For me, that goal was to address the question that has always shaped me, the question posed by the Trappist monk Merton and addressed by the physicist Einstein. Who are we? What is our origin? What is life? In this vast universe, is there life elsewhere? And what's the possibility of identifying it? The curious Nancy Drew in me was determined to find out. At Caltech, I made rocket payloads and launched them with my fellow students from the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico and analyzed satellite data on double star systems. Through hard and persistent work, a little luck, and the friendships I had with other students and postdocs, I discovered something new about these objects namely pulsating X-ray emission, 
during episodes of mass transfer from a normal star onto a degenerate star. That made my early reputation and got me job offers after I received my PhD. And that's a picture of what I still think is about the, the happiest day, or certainly one of them of my life, was getting that hard-earned PhD with my mom and dad and little sister Zoe. I took the offer of a permanent job rather than a postdoctoral fellowship at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. That's where I met the first gentleman while rock climbing on the cliffs above the Rio Grande River. Rock climbing was an early passion from my Stanford days, and the picture on the left shows me in, at uh, Yosemite. And it was Chris's passion too. So, it's funny that our marriage started on the rocks, since that's where some marriages end. We skied in sunshine and whiteouts. We climbed after work and on weekends, and even made first ascents. We got married in Las Vegas, whoops, on a camping trip. <laughs> it lasted. <laughs> we had two children, both born in Santa Fe, New Mexico. When they were one and three years old, we moved to Penn State, where I'd been offered a job as the head of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics in a full professorship. Chris was offered a job doing science outreach for the Office of the Dean of Science there. After a few years, I was asked by the head of NASA to become the agency's chief scientist. I was the first woman and the youngest person to do so. That was actually a quandary for me, as it meant leaving research, which I had tried so hard to be involved with, for a while at least, and moving into the world of space science policy. I finally accepted the position when all my women friends, including mom, said that I shouldn't talk about how important it is for women to step up and say yes to opportunity and then not do so myself. I had a chance to be a national role model for women in science, they said. I accepted that role, taking a leave of absence from Penn State. The head of NASA credited me with bringing science back to NASA. I represented NASA on studies of the nation's investments in Antarctica. And yes, I got to the South Pole the solar system, and the search for life beyond Earth. After three years there, I was due to go back to Penn State, but I was offered the position of Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Santa Barbara, and I accepted that. I continued my science and saw my telescope that I had built launched into space on a European satellite called XMM Newton, and it still orbits the Earth today, returning important multi wavelength data about the cosmos. Six years later, I became chancellor at UC Riverside, where I laid the foundation for a new medical school, the first for California in more than 40 years. In making these steps, I felt I was expanding my portfolio from research to policy to higher education administration. For me, it was all interesting, challenging, and that's what attracted me. I had a big appetite to do more, to learn and experience more. I have a certain fearlessness of trying new things. Maybe it comes from climbing rocks high above the ground. You just put one hand, one foot a little higher, and then the next hand, the next foot. If you have a great partner, you're confident of the belay in case you fall. And little by little, you make the summit. Chris made this journey with me. He continued with science education and outreach 
contributing value for students at every university at which we landed. He provided me the belay line. The Purdue trustees came calling just as I was starting a new medical school at UC Riverside. After much examination of my conscience, I accepted the invitation to become Purdue's 11th president. It was the opportunity to speak from a larger stage. So that's a summary of my laps around the track, although it was not as quick or as smooth as I've described. Every lap was different. Some were challenging, most were rewarding. I didn't have, as you can see, a strategic plan for my life. I have an appetite for discovery. I'm an explorer and I follow my best instincts. Now I'd like to shift gears and talk about the miles that I've covered at Purdue. As I described in my State of the University speech last month, there are many highlights that happened during my tenure here. You saw some of them in the video, in, like increases in student success, research achievements, global outreach, and faculty enhancements. I'm not going to enumerate those in this lecture. There's a time sequence online. Instead, I'll address three questions that I hear frequently from students. And these are they. What achievement are you most proud of? What was the most difficult challenge you faced? What do you think your legacy will be? I'm most proud of making transformative change with students, undergraduate students, graduate students. From starting SOGA funding to starting new facilities to launching new policies, we've accomplished much together. I've helped enable the dreams and aspirations of students, and this has been a great pleasure as president. I started my tenure by including students on all eight of the working groups that put together the university's strategic plan called New Synergies. Student body president Eric Van Houten was the student member of the steering committee that put together the final plan. Student body president Eric Barnard helped the administration to come up with a winning business plan to renovate the Co-Rex Center at a cost of nearly $100 million. It will be a major benefit to students who will follow you. The next student body president, you might think was named Eric, but it wasn't. It was Adam Klein. We worked on courting legislators to get state bonding approval for the COREC renovation. And we formulated the concept for the Center for Student Excellence and Leadership, or CSEL. This would be a great gathering place for students, where ideas could take root and academic help could be more easily acquired. Adam was the student representative on the university's budget committee through the Great Recession, when we had to find ways to cut and contain costs. I was then fortunate to work with Brad Kreitz and his great cabinet on many policy issues, including bereavement, medical amnesty, expanding the diversity language in Purdue's policy to include sexual orientation. He and Tyler advocated for C-cell with donors. And on Friday of this week, you're going to see how that has paid off in a special announcement that we'll have on C-cell. This year, Brett Hiley and his cabinet took the medical amnesty policy to the state level. His team showed how students can affect policy at the highest levels. 
He started on the road to secure legal services for students. We've also worked together on getting a student voice in determining fees through a new student advisory board. I know Joe Rust, I know him because he's been in my president's leadership class for two years now, but I know that he's going to take Purdue one brick higher. You can't have trust without rust. <laughs> That's your line, Joe. I've worked with visionary leaders of the graduate student government, most recently with Rebecca Logston. She and past presidents, Andy Robinson, Richard Sevier, Salvador Acuna, and Anindya Chatterjee have represented well all the graduate students, their goals. It's been my privilege to work with four superb student trustees, Rachel Cumberbatch, who helped recruit me, Jill Steiner, Tyler Takel, and presently Miranda McCormick. Together, we've advocated for funding for new student-centered facilities, like CISO at the trustees level, and other projects along 3rd Street, which we call the Student Success Corridor, as well as policy changes to improve student life. Chris and I have also made time to enjoy life with our own students, Anne and Stephen and their significant others. Our daughter Anne will be marrying a Boilermaker this summer. The most difficult challenge I faced? Definitely the economic recession, which hit its peak in 2008 and 9. Everyone wanted their money back. The governor, the state, students, parents. The trustees wanted cost cutting and more efficiency in operation. The governor asked for $45 million to be paid almost immediately. The state cut our appropriations dramatically. The public and students and parents wanted lower tuition increases. At least we were fortunate to be competitive because of our outstanding faculty and research staff for stimulus funding from the federal government and research awards from federal agencies. Our Purdue family in those years made many sacrifices. Salary freezes, cutbacks in retirement benefits, curtailment in hiring, cuts in cost containment in energy utilization and information technology. But today, we're stronger than ever. We will have another salary this raise this spring for our faculty and staff. We kept to within the Commission for Higher Education's recommendation on tuition increase during the last budget cycle, and we're expanding our hiring of faculty right now. And for the first time in Purdue's history, we've launched on a true 10-year funding plan, which identifies new revenue-generating initiatives, like the trimester plan. We've launched a new Center for Innovation and Commercialization, and we're thoroughly revamping our opportunities for learning. We used a crisis, the recession, to adapt with the first ever, ever decadal funding plan that is innovative and it's sustainable. Even in a recession, we've received gifts from alumni and friends totaling more than a billion dollars in less than five years, even in a recession with no formal campaign. That's the loyalty of our alumni and friends. And this has given us new opportunities for scholarships. Our scholarships are up at least 50% in the last five years. Endowment, fat facilities, programs. I think my legacy will be an enhancement in the way Purdue is regarded. The value of a Purdue degree is held higher 
than ever before. There's no doubt when our alumni come back, they tell us, wow, that Purdue degree, everywhere I go, it really means something. Purdue is climbing in the estimation of everyone. It's becoming better known worldwide. The achievements of its faculty, of its staff and students have been celebrated in publications, television, and other forms of media. Everyone knows about our Nobel Prize winner, our National Medal of Technology recipients. There have been two in the last few years. Our World Food Prize winners, also two. Our astronauts, our athletes, and so many more standouts. We're more competitive than ever in garnering large research awards. We're more selective at the West Lafayette campus, admitting better prepared students who stay in school and graduate. You are achieving record levels of success. You are winning prizes and earning distinction for your university. You, through your service, are impacting communities locally and all over the world. The campus is much more diverse in its student body. Students and faculty are more involved in shared governance. Research awards are higher than ever before. There are new mechanisms for seeding innovation and taking it to new stages of commercialization. Discovery to delivery is being realized. There are many new buildings under construction that are dedicated to students' success and research achievement. The world, word global has new meaning on this campus as record number of students are studying or doing research or service projects overseas and we have record numbers of students from overseas here. A global credential is viewed as essential for future success by students and our faculty see a great opportunity to expand our land-grant mission worldwide. We're on the last lap of my lecture. My life has been a Grand Prix of sorts. I drove my own vehicle, but it wasn't made by me alone. I had a lot of help from great teams for which I am deeply grateful. While I defined my own unique path, it had the twists and turns of the roadway, and I've had to adapt. I've driven the vehicle hard with focus, and I've also been lucky. In fact, I feel blessed. Lessons learned. I have 10 of them for you. Number one, don't fret about your pole position. Sometimes you start in the number one spot. You're ahead of the pack and people are cheering. Sometimes you're struggling and being bumped around. You're not in your comfort zone. People are still cheering but for somebody else. Stay focused. Number two, your team, family and friends, supports you in the pit and while you're driving. Your team is your anchor. It reinforces you and gives you advice. It puts you back on the roadway when you need to come off. Listen to your team members and respect them. Number three, I'm not the first person to say this, but it's always sound advice, wear sunscreen. <laughs> Number four, 
Your book of life is what you learn along the way. Fill it up by paying attention, absorbing the experience, and improving by doing. Every lap counts. Number five, pay attention to the flags. They're there for a reason. If you don't mind them, well, you might be disqualified. Number six, have fun while racing. Smile and help others stay on course. Number seven, there are surprises along the way. Be ready and drive through them with both hands on the wheel. Number eight, finishing matters. Finish strong. Number nine, winners don't all look the same. Show confidence. You're a winner, too. And number 10, the Iron Key students who created the unfinished Block P understood that the Purdue experience is never finished. You don't know how many laps you'll get. I'm hoping that Chris and I will have many more together. We'd love to see our kids get married and have children, for example. No pressure in case you're listening <laughs> on webcast. I'd love to finish a book I've started and write another that I began long ago when I was a college student. Chris would like to continue learning about natural history and science education. I'd love to go in orbit around the Earth and see our planet in all its beauty without borders. Make a bucket list, students, and then boiler up. Thank you, students. It's been a privilege to work with you and an honor to be your president. Hail Purdue. Thank you. At this time, uh, we'll bring the microphones to the center aisles, um, and Dr. Cordova so graciously um, offered to uh, host some questions from audience members. So if you have a question, feel free to come up. And, and while we're getting things up, why don't we thank her again? I'm near the mic, I'll go ahead and go first then. Thanks, uh, Matt. So my name is Matt Bartlett. I'm a second year uh, MBA student. I've been here as long as you now. Uh, as you look back personally at the past five years, what do you for yourself consider to be the defining experience for you at Purdue? All right, Matt. Well, there, there are a lot of defining moments. So what comes immediately uh, to my mind was Earlier this fall, at one of the football games, the band leader, uh, Jay Gephardt, I was out there on the field cheering. I had just given Danny Hope, our coach, some, uh, some words of uh, confidence and go get them and all. So I was just standing there, and uh, Jay Gephardt asked me if I would like to lead the Hail Purdue song from the ladder. And so, um, so the conductor was there, came down, and I went up and led the Hail Purdue. And that was about as close as I've come to tears, because I realized I, it, it could have been my last football game, in fact, that I would never be there doing that again. It just meant a lot to me. So that, that was really a defining moment that brought everything together.
Hi, I'm Jonathan Gandalf. I'm a senior on Mortar Board. Uh, so you took what I assume is a unique path to NASA. I don't imagine many scientists begin at Mademoiselle. Uh, and we've got a lot of seniors who are about to graduate and take our own unique paths. What would you uh, give one piece of advice to those seniors who are going to be graduating soon? Well, a as you saw, I didn't really know where I was going when I graduated. So you, you also might be in that position. So there might be something brand new out there that you never thought of before. So you should be open to that uh, possibility. Just be open to the possibility because you could be headed down the path of being an English major and then you see something that inspires you and you say, oh, wow, that's, that's what I've always wanted to be and I just have one life and I, I got one chance to, uh, to get back on, on that path and just, uh, just to go for it. You know, when I, so I had the Stanford education and my, my parents had paid for that and they thought it was crazy to change gears and uh, go back to school and go get a PhD. They didn't even understand a PhD. I didn't have any money in my family had gotten one. And when they knew that I was back in school, and so by that time, obviously, I was supporting myself, um, they, they thought that that was nuts. And so I kind of had to hide out for a few years, you know, how, like, when you're too embarrassed to go home. and <laughs> You don't want people asking you awkward questions. But I, I thought it was really important to do that, and I loved every moment of it. And I, I just really loved my fellow students. We had great adventures. We danced a lot. We sang a lot. We partied a lot. Lot. And we studied a lot, so we made it. But uh, you, you get by with a lot of help from your friends. Matt talked about defining moments. Um, I'm more curious, what about some of the more fun moments that you've had as president? You know, as president, you have a great, uh, great opportunity to represent Purdue University in, in different capacities as well as you know, like going on the football fields, but what was one of the moments that you just really had a lot of fun because of your position as president? Well, I, I've had fun uh, eating at the dining courts. I've had fun doing the shout uh, during at the end of the uh, the third quarter in the football games. I I guess uh, a moment that was was fun in a kind of inspiring way just happened this Thursday. So let 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 me tell you what happened then. So I I had had. Uh, dinner the night before with uh, your roommate and a lot of the folks from your floor, Joe, and, and uh, why are you laughing? <laughs> you weren't there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so then I headed out on the plane to Washington, D.C., where, and um, so I, I had a, a role to play in um, a new role that I have, which is chairing the Smithsonian's Board of Regents. And they were doing a transfer of the shuttle, space shuttle discovery, because you know the shuttle program has stopped, which is kind of a poignant moment in the space program. And um, the Smithsonian won the opportunity to display the Discovery Space Shuttle at their second Air and Space Museum, which if you haven't seen it, you should. It's right by Dulles, so if you ever get on a long layover at, at the Dulles Airport, it's right next door. Big, huge hangars full of uh, amazing flying machines. So the Discovery had been two days before. It had come in on top of a Boeing 747. Everybody in Washington, D.C. was out to look at it, photographing it against the Washington Monument, all these other great uh, uh, museums and monuments. It was such a sight seeing these two airplanes, one on top of the other. Lands at Dulles. And so my role was to be part of the program that, that rolls it in there. We had 6,000 people. It was a spectacular sunny day. And so uh, John Glenn, the senator and twice astronaut, was sitting right next to me. Then the head of NASA, the uh, secretary of the Smithsonian, and the head of the National Air and Space Museum. And so the four of us were on the program. And I was actually the, the of official in charge of the, the transfer and the last words that were said before everybody signed the transfer agreement. So I just kind of, I had some prepared remarks, but I made a sort of off-the-cuff thing about NASA and the space program and Purdue and all our astronauts and our legacy in space. And I, I acknowledged not just our astronauts, because they, people like Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan, the first and last uh, men on the moon, would say that, that 
they got there because of all the engineers and scientists in the space program. So I uh, wanted to acknowledge all our Purdue alumni who had done and were doing that. And, um, and then the Smithsonian. So I had three roles at the same time. I had the new Smithsonian role, the older NASA role, and the present Purdue role. And, and then I got emails. They just started coming in in the last couple of days from our alumni who are part of the space program and either were there or were part of one of our NASA space centers somewhere and saw it on a webcast or saw it on CNN because it played a couple times this weekend, including the Silver Twins. I'm sure you remember our Silver Twins. They're both in Washington, D.C. And But all these engineers, and they were just so... Uh, amazed at, I, I mean, such a special moment for them, closing a program, then having the shuttle, which is the icon of their dreams. Uh, all the 31 astronauts were there, all of whom had flown in discovery in that space shuttle, many of whom had been the commanders, including Eileen Collins, the first woman to com command a shuttle. And it was just wrapped it all up for me in one moment. They are standing in the sunshine and talking about all these things that matter to me. It was like my whole life was in that moment. And I was just so, um, so proud to represent those three things and to have people say that it was an inspiring moment for them. So that was, it. That was a long story. Sorry. <laughs> it meant a lot to me. Hi, President Cordova. I'm Sean Lyons, and uh, you have Sean. such an extensive list of accomplishments, but I'm wondering if, uh, have you reached that point where you think, well, this is it, this is, I've reached all of my goals, or, um, and everything else past this point is just a cherry on top, or is there still a goal uh, in the near future that you would find is the ultimatum? Well, well um, maybe the ultimate, not the ultimate. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, well, I, I guess, um, you know, watching the, the generations go by and seeing the pleasure that uh, all our friends take in, in having grandchildren is just a really big deal. So uh, I, they, 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 they say that it's the most underrated experience, that uh, they're all so enthusiastic about it. So, um, so, so certainly enjoying that with, with Chris is, is, you know, enjoying our next goal is a wedding in June uh, of a, our daughter. And uh, we found out this uh, last week that his last name, which is a German last name, actually means maker in German. Now, how about that? How did that happen? <laughs> that my daughter is really marrying a boiler maker. Um, but so that, but for, uh, for my own um, path, that, my own path that I, I'm kind of a driven woman, I really would like to write those books. That is, that is, the, that is it for next year. I'm, I love writing, and I really, really uh, think it's, for me, it's a great way to express uh, things that I can't express, I have a harder time expressing verbally. So I'm really looking forward to the experience of trying to get it all down on paper.